Hi, I'm John Kasrabi, Managing Attorney of the JQK Immigration Law Firm, handling cases for U.S. immigration from across the world. And today, I want to talk about some important points about getting a tourist visa and what they mean, and some important uh, precautions and things to avoid to prevent major problems from coming down the road. So we're going to discuss uh, five major points about applying for a U.S. tourist visa, what's called as a, a B-1 or a B-2 tourist visa, as well as one bonus for after you enter what you have to be watchful for. So it's a very important video, and from years of experience, I've accumulated this kind of stuff. I really want to share it because I've seen a lot of misinformation about this and misunderstanding about this throughout the internet. So we'll be back in a second. In the meantime, please like and subscribe to get more info just like this. Hi, once again, thank you for watching this video, and today we're going to talk about five important things you have to know about applying for a tourist visa before you apply, as well as one bonus at the end. So please watch to the end to catch that because I think all five, especially the bonus, are really important things to know. So, you know, you want to come and visit the United States. What do you have to do? Will you file for a tourist visa? It's called a B-1 or B-2, typically a B-2 tourist visa. But one thing that people ask is, well, I don't have a family member to sponsor me. Or they say, oh, my family member will sponsor me. What paperwork do they need to fill out? Or most likely, I get calls from people in the United States who want to bring their friends and family from overseas and want to sponsor them. Well, the reality is there is no sponsorship for a tourist visa. If a person wants to come to the United States as a visitor, they on their own apply for a tourist visa and no, no sponsorship is involved. Now, there is a form called uh, Form I-134, an affidavit of support, which is a U.S. person saying they're going to take care of the foreign person financially, but I've interviewed many consular officers. I have a podcast where I interview other uh, immigration lawyers and other embassy officers, and every one of them have told me they don't care about sponsorship paperwork, and if anything, it's considered a negative. Because a person who's coming here should be able to financially support themselves, they shouldn't need a person in the U.S. to be there financially. So the the first question I ask when people call me is, I don't have a sponsor or I want to sponsor somebody. There's none of that. The foreign person who wants to come here, you if you want to apply for a tourist visa, on your own, go to the Department of State's websites, get their information and apply for a U.S. tourist visa from your local embassy and that's that. Don't get caught up in this sponsorship and financial sponsorship kind of stuff. Uh, it's not necessary and if anything, it's, it's something that may even hurt your case. So be mindful of that. Okay, so that was the first thing. Let's move on to number two. Uh, having a U.S. relative or U.S. person is important or key to help in your case. Well, the reality is that's not the case. Having a person already in the United States that's your relative, for example, a boyfriend or girlfriend or spouse, will in many cases hurt the chances of getting the tourist visa. You got to keep in mind, and this is the main part of tip number two, is the whole goal of the U.S. Embassy officer in reviewing and interviewing you is to see if you come and visit the United States, will you be leaving and going back home? Because the purpose of a tourist visa is to come to the US temporarily, just for a trip and then come back home. So if there are reasons why they believe once you enter the United States, you won't be going back to your home country, they're not gonna issue the visa. So if you say, oh, you know, my boyfriend is there, oh, my fiance is there, oh, my spouse is there, my husband or wife is there, oh, my parents live there, that just increases the chances of a consular officer saying, well, this person his family is there and so what would stop them from you know just going to the US and not coming back and violating their tourist visa just stay in the United States and try to start a living over there and that's why their focus is mostly and almost entirely other than trying to avoid fraud or terrorism and stuff like that is is this person gonna return home so they want to see that you have family back home to return to maybe spouse and kids uh, you have work to home, go back to you have assets to return to so you have a life in your home country, that's gonna require you to go back so they're not worried that you're gonna go abandon, abandon all that stuff and remain in the United States. So think about that if you're going to interview, how can you show that you're gonna go back home and not stay inside the United States? Okay, so that was number two. Let's move on to number three. Number three is that not all tourist visas, known as the B visas, are the same. There's a B1, there's a B2, there's even a B2 for medical purposes. So let's go through this, and it's very important when you do apply for your tourist visa, make it clear what your intent is so the officer could give you the appropriate visa category. And importantly, when you're entering the United States, you want to make sure the officer at the airport or land port uh, that's reviewing your documents knows why you're entering so they give the appropriate one. And I'll explain why. A B-1 is a person coming for temporary business services, not to do work in the United States, which is illegal with a tourist visa, but maybe coming here to do negotiations, review a contract, or stuff like that. 
A B2 is a person coming for recreational purposes, a tourism, going to Disneyland, going to do something fun in the United States. There's also a subcategory of B2 for people that are coming for medical purposes. And so each of these have their reasons and you really want to have the proper uh, visa category assigned to you at the embassy or when you enter the United States. Now at the embassy, sometimes they'll say, um, they'll give you a, a B1 slash B2 visa, that's fine. But when you enter the United States, be careful. So if you're coming to the United States, for example, there's investor type visas. So you're entering the United States to invest money to then apply for one of these visas. You want to tell the officer at the airport, yeah, I'm here to review some properties to purchase because I plan on doing an investor visa. And so please give me a B1 visa. So later on, they don't accuse you of doing this investment activity on a recreational visa and make it sound like you're not being honest. So that's one thing to be watchful for and to explain there. And also, um, typically people are just coming on the B2, which is a tourist visa, but the B2 medical uh, has stringent requirements. The whole point of the B2 medical is to be able to show that the medical help that you need is not available in your home country. You found a doctor in the US who writes that that help is only in the United States and that you can financially support yourself and pay all the doctor's bills. So there's a lot that goes into this medical kind of stuff to get that visa. So you really wanna have your ducks in a row, be honest, express everything and have the paperwork ready to show what your intent is because what happens is later on they could come back, and especially under the current administration, come back and say, oh, you lied during that entry, you lied during that visa interview, you weren't forthright and clear and telling and telling us uh, what your reason for entering the United States was. So be mindful of getting the right visa category uh, in, in all this. And sometimes it's out of your control. The officers will just assign something at the border, at the embassy. And most of the time, it'll be okay because they don't put pressure on it. But you never know when your next status, your next visa status comes up or you're doing an interview, how this stuff could come back and be problematic and troublesome later on. So you really want to be careful for this kind of stuff. Which brings me to tip number four. And this is a really important one. When you are applying for the visa, you know, speaking about misrepresentation, make sure that you pre uh, prepare the documents properly. You put the right information on there. I can't count how many times I've seen people who had their friend complete the form DS-160, the application, for a tourist visa or the travel agency, the person booking their tickets filled it out and did not consult with them and did just put some information that was wrong, deficient or missing. Well, that goes on the record and right now everything is digital with the immigration system, at the embassies and everything. So whatever you put there is gonna stay there and everyone's gonna have access to it in the government and could use it against you later on. So if they talk about and ask you about your employment history for the last five or 10 years, you have to specify each one. If they talk about your residential history, travels, anything they ask, you, you have to 100% be truthful and have no inconsistency in there. So make sure you read it yourself. Um, if you have someone helping you out with it, have a, another person too that speaks English go and review that document. You do not want to have typos. You do not want to have missing information because that will come back later in future applications and become an inconsistency. And if they spot an inconsistency where you tell them something new in the future and it doesn't match up with a previous tourist visa application, that could lead to an accusation of misrepresentation or fraud and cause inadmissibility which is a ban on you from being able to enter the United States or if you're already in the United States, deportation and have you, you know, kicked out. And this could happen to people that are married to U.S. citizens, that are family members of U.S. citizens even. It's a very strict situation and I encounter this a lot, honestly, because not that the people were intentionally lying on their application, but they didn't bother filling out themselves or they didn't proofread it. They thought it was a joke, that it was just something you fell out. No, it's very, very serious, this document, this DS-160, and any paperwork you submit to U.S. immigration authorities or that you tell them orally. This all goes on a record and could be used against you in the future. So be very careful and honest and explain everything when you're completing these applications and going through the process. So that brings us to uh, tip number five, and this is another important one because of recent changes that the administration has done is uh, when you do get a tourist visa, there's different uh, you know, lengths, costs, and other things associated with the visa. So typically a, a B tourist visa, a B1 or B2 is for 10 years for most countries. However, it's not for every country. And how do you check to see the length of the visa you can potentially get? Well, there's a, v there's a website for the State Department called the Visa Reciprocity Chart. And you go to this website, the Visa Reciprocity Chart, you go to the country you have a passport for, and then you click that link, it takes you to a page, and has a bunch of letters at top, A through Z. And these are the various visa categories. Well, it doesn't go to Z exactly, but it's initial for uh, every category there is. You click on the B category, and it lists uh, a various piece of information that would be helpful. First of all, up to what length of visa time they could give a person from that country. So many countries will be a 10-year visa, 
but it doesn't necessarily mean that the officer will give you the full 10 years. They could give you less if they want to, but typically they give you the maximum. However, it's not always 10 years. Some countries have three months, some countries have five years. It varies, so you wanna check there what the length of time that you have is on that website. Now, another thing, a second thing you need to check on that website is what the visa reciprocity fee is. You know, recently the administration redid the fees, so if someone from that foreign country wants to apply for a tourist visa, uh, it says what additional fees, in addition to the DS-160 application fee, that a foreign person will have to pay if their tourist visa is approved. So you wanna check what that is. And third, you wanna see whether uh, you are getting what's called a multi multiple entry visa or a single entry visa. Many visas, if you use it once, you could just leave and use it again. It's multiple uh, uses. You just keep reusing it until it expires. But some countries only have a single use visa. So there's countries, for example, once you get the visa, tourist visa, you enter United States, that visa becomes void and canceled out. And if you leave, then you'll need to get another visa, go to the interview process again and apply for a new tourist visa. It's a big hassle. Many times those countries who have single use visas also have a limited amount of time that they can use the visa, like for three months. So just watch out for this and don't be surprised about the length of time, if it's multiple or single entry visa or the costs associated with it. So that was the main five things I wanted to talk with you about now. And now we're gonna get to the bonus, which is after you get the visa, you get on a plane in most cases, and you fly into the United States, you go to the airport, and you deal with Port Authority, CBP, uh, Customs and Border Protection. Out there, they ask you what's your purpose of entry, they check you out, all that kind of stuff. They stamp your passport, in that stamp, it says what visa category you're entering in, and it also gives you a time and date that you can stay in the U.S. until. Usually it's six months on a tourist visa, so it says like a B2, valid for, you know, add six months to the date that you enter, and that's how much it's valid for. Now that stamp they give is not the official say of what your length of stay is. There's a form called uh, Form I-94, Records of Admissions and, and Exits or something like that. And what's important is before, before 19, uh, 2013, there was a piece of paper that was stamped in your passport that was this Form I-94, but now it's online. So what you need to do is after you exit the airport, go to a computer in the next couple of days after entering and type in Form I-94, well, the first link should be from the Custom Border Protection website. Click on that link, enter the website, and click on your online form I-94. And in there, you fill out your name, uh, you fill out your date of birth, uh, your passport number, the country you're from, that kind of information. And it should, in most cases, take you to a page that's your online I-94, which specifies your name, passport number, but importantly, what visa type you entered on and how much time you have on that visa in the United States, how long you can be there. Sometimes the stamp will be inconsistent with the I-94, and sometimes people don't know how much time they have in the United States. They don't understand the system. We go there and it says admit until, and it'll give you the expiration date of your stay in the US, and you have to leave before that time. So it's really important you check because mistakes and errors do happen frequently. So sometimes you want six months, the officer only gives you two days by accident because they press the wrong button. Well, you have two days, your status is going to expire and you're going to be here illegally. So if those kind of errors happen, then you want to probably reach out to an attorney, which will then reach out to the Customs and Border Protection uh, Airport that you entered in to try to correct your I-94 for that error so you avoid you know, violating your immigration status. But either way, you always want to check to make sure you enter on the proper visa status. If not, they correct it. There's cases, uh, which is not tourist visa, but cases where people have a green card pending, they travel on advanced parole, and then they accidentally, when they re-enter the United States on this thing called advanced parole, the officer puts the wrong visa category in there at their re-entry, and that causes their green card case to disappear and be abandoned and be in violation. That's another talk for another time, but it's very important to always check your online I-94 when you enter the United States for these kind of errors, and if it doesn't show up, then reach out to um, Customs and Border Protection to see why it doesn't show up, because it's good to have these records so they don't accuse you later of not being honest or not you know, entering legally, all that kind of stuff. So I hope that information helped. It's really important to know this to avoid future immigration issues. If you needed help, please contact my office for a consultation. My email is info at jqklaw.com. My name is John Kasravi. There are fees associated with the consultation, but to start, just email me, briefly describe what your situation is, if I give you a you know, one sentence answer, I'll try my best. If not, we can schedule a video consultation to really dig in deep to see how we can help you through this process. Again, my email is info at jqklaw.com. I'm John Kasravi. Please subscribe to get more updates just like this. And I look forward to hearing the good news that you're here in America and enjoying your time. God bless everybody and have a good one. Bye-bye.